welcome Emmanuel for this Sunday the 3rd of May. We welcome as our preacher Ian Chidlow, the curate at St Mary's Cheadle. And we're going to begin by being reminded of God's great, great promises, what we're looking forward to. And Barbara's going to read Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. The reading is taken from Revelation chapter 21, beginning to read at verse 1, the new Jerusalem. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This is the word of the Lord. But how do we get there? How do we get to those great promises? How can we sinners be there? What hope do we have? Only the mercy and kindness and grace of God, as we see most fully in his Son, Jesus Christ. We're going to sing Christ Alone, Cornerstone.
no guilt in life, no fear in death, because we trust Christ's death for our sins, which we now confess. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. We have confidence because Jesus Christ is our good shepherd. And we're going to sing a version of Psalm 23. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you alone. And I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me home. He guides my way. one who long ago trusted God's promises. And now Pam is going to read for us Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. Our reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, the call of Abram. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. 
Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued towards the Negev. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning to you all. Uh, my name's Ian. I'm the curate at St. Mary's Cheadle. Um, I'm told this is going out to St. Andrews and Emmanuel. So hello to all of you. I hope you're doing well in, um, in lockdown. We've got a really uh, exciting passage today that I hope will encourage us and spur us on. We're going to think about three things from Genesis 12. Um, the first one is the call to trust. And then we've got the call to patience. And then finally, the call to proclaim. So the call to trust, the call to patience and the call to proclaim. But before we get into that, let's pray together and ask God for help as we read his word. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's living and active, that it challenges us and encourages us and spurs us on. We pray you do that for us this morning by your spirit. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the fulfilment of your promises. Help us to long for that future that you've promised where we will be with him. And in the meantime, give us courage to tell others about that amazing future hope. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Sorry we don't have three Ps for the headings, by the way. I couldn't think of another P for trust. <laughs> but, uh, let's get into the passage. So verse 1, the call to trust. God had uh, spoken to Abraham, we're told, and asked him to leave everything behind and go to the land that God would show him. And that, that's a big deal, right? Let's just say that right off the bat. It's not easy. And in a culture where family is everything, Abraham's being told to leave his father's house, leave the land that he knows and go uh, to this strange land that God will show him. That's hard. Uh, and it would take a lot of trust to do that. And Hebrews 11 verse 8 tells us that Abraham steps out in faith, not knowing what will come to pass, not seeing immediate results but trusting God's promises to him. He exchanges the known for the unknown. He was able to do this because again, as Hebrews 11 uh, verse 16 puts it, he was longing for a better country, a heavenly country. So he was able to hold the things of this world lightly. He trusted that what was in front of him was so much better than what he was being asked to leave behind. Uh, even though what he left behind was home and the family he loved. And it's no different these days, really. Uh, God may not call you to leave your family and your home and your country behind, although he does do that to Christian missionaries uh, all over the world. But he calls all of us to hold lightly to the worldly trappings, to the things that the world offers, that the world says are everything. Uh, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. It's not easy to trust God and follow. Jesus says it won't be easy. There's no messing about with him. Um, and, and we can only do that. We can only take up our cross and follow if we trust, as Abraham did, that what is coming so far outweighs everything we've left behind, that it is worth it. And so uh, the, the question 
for us, I guess, off the back of this is, uh, are the promises of God worth trusting? Are they worth more to you than your house, your second car, or even your car, your family, your friends, the respect of your colleagues? Are the promises of God worth dying for? As Christians all over the world today will do. This is hard. Do we really, really trust God enough to follow his call on our lives? Well, Abraham did. Uh, back to the passage, here's the second point, the call to patience. So verse four, Abraham takes Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and uh, they get up and they head to Canaan with uh, with some of their stuff. But really, they've only got God's promises to lean on. There's no other security for them here, is there? And we know uh, that we don't see those promises come to pass in today's passage. And we know that Abraham himself in his lifetime won't see those promises come to pass. In fact, he has to wait decades before he even has one son, let alone a whole nation of people. Abraham uh, didn't see Israel. Abraham didn't see uh, when they finally settled in the promised land. Abraham didn't see when God came to dwell in the temple among his people. Abraham didn't see the end of God's promises to him. But he trusted, he believed God, he was patient. Uh, uh, we too are still waiting for that final fulfilment of Genesis 12, 1 to 3. We're waiting for that day when God finally gathers all his children, all his people together um, into the promised land, the new creation, uh, and lives with his people forever, aren't we? We're waiting for that last day when that happens. Uh, and in the meantime, we can't see it. So we trust, we obey, <clears throat> excuse me, and we wait for it patiently. <laughs> but the world is impatient. <laughs> Patience is a virtue that's lacking in my generation. I don't know about yours. But Christians should be patient people. That's what we should be known for. We should be known as people who can wait on the Lord to do his thing in his time. Christians, um, for, for Christians, patience means no grumbling. It means no demanding our rights. It means no rushing. It means accepting and trusting by faith that God will bring his plans and promises to pass in his perfect time. Which again is hard. But you know, there's nothing more off-putting than a grumbling Christian, a Christian who just complains all the time. I don't mean we should bottle up our emotions, that we shouldn't be real, of course not. But you know uh, the sort of person I mean, that person who just loves to grumble for grumbling's sake. Well, that person hasn't learned patience. But God loves patience. In fact, patience uh, is a fruit of the Spirit, if you read Galatians 5. Patience is a godly virtue, a noble virtue, and it's a virtue that should characterise mature Christians. Um, a Christian who just wants everything in the here and now, who keeps saying, well, where is God? What's God doing? Come on, God. They've really missed the point, haven't they? They haven't understood what's to come, as Abraham did. So are we known as patient people? Well, that, that's a challenge for me. I, I don't think I'm particularly patient. Um, at this time when we're all stuck at home because of the virus it's a challenge when will it end when will we be allowed out again to see family and friends all we can do is pray and be patient it is a challenge but what an opportunity for the church to show the world and tell the world about our God who is sovereign who is directing everything for our good who has everything under control on our behalf so how do we patiently wait on this God? Well, by faith, we long for what is coming. That's what the book of Hebrews says Abraham was doing. He realised what was in front was so much better than what he left behind. So we do the same. We fix our eyes on Jesus, as Hebrews 12 says, the one who has gone before, the guarantee of God's promises. We look to him and we long for the day when we'll be with him face to face forever. And we realise that nothing that this world has to offer is any better than that. It pales in comparison with the future God has promised to us. And so we don't scramble for everything in the here and now. We hold lightly to things of the world and we wait. 
because we've got a guaranteed future that's coming in God's time. So back to the passage, let's finish off the passage. Uh, point three, this is uh, the call to proclaim. In verse six, Abraham and his uh, family, they arrive in Canaan and they travel through the land to Shechem as far as the great tree of Moreh. And the Lord appears to Abraham again and renews his promises. And having received the promise again, in verse seven, Abraham builds an altar to the Lord and calls on his name and worships his God. What Abraham's doing here is planting a flag in the ground. He's walked right into enemy territory. Notice that the Canaanites are still living in the land at this point. And he's built an altar to his God. He's saying this land belongs to God now. It belongs to the one true God. Foreign gods and Canaanite idols are no longer welcome. God rules here. And then for the rest of our reading, he travels through the land doing the same, building altars, calling on God's name. Walking through the land God has promised to give him and claiming it for the Lord, saying this is God's now. And again, there's a message for us here. We've seen that we're to trust God and wait for his glorious future promises. But we're not just to um, rest on our laurels, sit on our hands, are we? We're to tell the world about Jesus. That's our job. And just as Abraham walked into enemy territory and planted his flag and proclaimed the Lord. So we as the church have the job of living in this um, dark world and speaking the light of Christ into it. It's easy to think that our greatest need at the moment is a cure for the coronavirus. And of course, we, we long for that. We pray for that. That would be fantastic. But it's not our greatest need. Our greatest need in this world is for Jesus Christ. A life apart from Jesus ends in hell, which frankly will make the coronavirus fuss seem like a, a great party in comparison. And we don't want that for anybody, do we? No, we don't want that for anyone. And so we must proclaim the Lord Jesus to any and all who will listen, that some might be saved by God's grace. That's our job. We may be stuck in our homes, but we're still to proclaim the Lord in any way, using any means we can, so that people might hear about the salvation that's on offer in Christ. We want everyone to know and share in the fulfilment of Genesis 12, 1 to 3, don't we? That great future day that we've thought about. We want everyone to enjoy that future promise as God gathers his children in Christ to live with him forever. And so we proclaim Jesus as the way to salvation. So we've seen that as God's people, we're to trust, uh, to trust him and let go of the enticements that the world offers. We've seen that we're called to be patient, waiting as he works in his good time. Uh, and while we wait for that day, we're called to proclaim Jesus. Let's not lose sight of those calls, especially now. I just wanted to finish on Revelation 21 to remind us of what's coming. Revelation 21 says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Can we trust that this future is worth letting go of our worldly comfort for? Can we patiently wait for this future without grumbling that God isn't working to our schedule? Can we proclaim with all our strength to all who will listen that Jesus Christ is the only way to this future? Let's ask for God's help before we finish. Our Lord, thank you for these promises in Genesis 12. These promises that mean everything to us, that mean our salvation. Lord, help us to trust you to let go of the things that the world 
threatens to tangle us up with and to follow you wholeheartedly as Abraham did. Help us to wait patiently as Abraham did for your promises to come to pass, even though it takes a long time. Help us to understand that you are working in your perfect time. And Lord, help us to, uh, to plant that flag, to proclaim the Lord Jesus into a dark world. Give us courage to do that. Give us uh, what we need to do that in lockdown. Lord, encourage us from this passage today, we pray, by your spirit and keep us going. Until that day when Jesus does return and these promises finally come to pass and we enter glory with him. We ask it in his name. Amen. The virus has changed so many things, but it hasn't changed what we believe. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now Pam and Ken will lead us in prayer. Today we're going to use the Lord's Prayer to guide our intercessions. So we'll begin by praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. As we pray the Lord's Prayer, you may like to keep your eyes on the screen as Pam signs each phrase in British Sign Language. So we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we continue in prayer, each time I say, Our Father in heaven, please respond with, Hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed, hallowed be, be your, your name. name. Wonderful, loving God, we thank you that we can call you our Father. We rejoice that we are your children by adoption through faith in Jesus and that one day we will receive our inheritance to be with you always because you have promised this in your word. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Lord, we live in a world filled with insecurity and uncertainty. But you are our king who calls us to walk by faith. We thank you for Abraham's example to us. Whatever our circumstances, Lord, you call us to practice faith each and every day. Help us to be obedient to your call, that your will may be done and your kingdom come. 
our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, Father, we have so often prayed those words and by your love you have responded so generously. But we hear every day of great needs in this country and around the world. We bring before you those who do not have enough to eat because of poverty due to conflict, climate change, homelessness or unemployment. We pray for those who are working to feed the hungry, food banks and individuals, churches and charities, councils and governments. Give us all understanding, compassion and generosity and give our leaders wisdom and insight to see how things can and must change. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be, be your, your name. name. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Father God, it's so easy for us to see faults in others, but we know that for every finger we point, there are four fingers pointing back at us. Protect us from being judgmental in our thoughts and in our actions. Show us where we are proud or selfish or lacking in understanding. By your Spirit, help us to be more like Jesus, so we might forgive others, just as you have forgiven us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lead us not into temptation. Father God, temptation comes to us all the temptation to waste time, to put things off until tomorrow, to feel sorry for ourselves, to give up when things become difficult, to keep quiet when we should speak out, to grumble and criticise and, of course, to put ourselves first. By your Holy Spirit, Give us your strength to resist temptation and the determination to obey you, trusting your plans for our lives. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Deliver us from evil. Father God, we live in a troubled world and among people who are fearful for their future. Please help us to share the love, the peace and the hope that we have in you. Be near to all who are suffering in mind, body or spirit and especially those who are on our hearts at this time. With gratitude we give thanks for those who are caring for them. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. May they know your comfort and peace. Please surround our families and friends our Christian brothers and sisters and our church leaders with your protection. And Lord, we pray that our nation will turn back to you. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. 
Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our final hymn is Trust and Obey, what Abraham did and what we must do. of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. <laughs>